Governor Polis. Hey, good, good. How you doing, Mark? Chris, good to see you both. Likewise. So last fall, more than 100 world leaders gathered for the COP26 Climate Summit discussing international goals and priorities for addressing climate change. We're very excited today to talk to you about how those national goals around climate policy can be addressed and amplified at the state level. Across the West, wildfires have been one of the most devastating consequences of climate change, and the Colorado Division of Fire Prevention and Control says the average wildfire season is now 78 days longer than the historical four months previously, and that Colorado now experiences large fires almost every month. What are the states like yours doing to prevent and respond to these stronger wildfire seasons? So I'd really say the fire season is now all year long in Colorado. In fact, as you know, in the summer of 2020, we had the three largest uh, wildfires in the history of our state. Uh, but you know what? Just last December, uh, in December of all months, the middle of winter, a few months, three months ago, four months ago, we had uh, the most destructive fire in the history of our state that destroyed over a thousand homes in Boulder County, the Marshall Fire. So uh, this is a year round threat. We also have drought conditions year round. Um, we're going to get into how we need to lead on climate and how the, the urgency is now. But but certainly as we develop around this drier, hotter climate, we need more defense perimeters around neighborhoods. That means areas that uh, don't have uh, potential fuel like grass or trees. Uh, we need to make sure that homes are built in a more resilient way. Uh, when when people are are near forested areas, they need to uh, do mitigation and remove uh, fuel that could potentially transfer a fire to their home. So there's a lot of different ways that we need to adapt to avoid these catastrophic fires with the reality of the hotter, drier weather. In addition to wildfires, what other big climate concerns do you have in Colorado and, and what solutions have you been working on to address them? You know, uh, there's there's a lot. So, for instance, I'll give you one that people might not think about if they don't live in Colorado. When wildfires hit, they denude entire you know mountains and hills of all their trees and all their vegetation. What does that mean? Landslides when the rains come. Right. And so we actually had a major landslide in Glenwood Canyon main route, you know, between Aspen and, and the Denver metro area. Uh, and the entire mountain collapsed up to 10, 15 feet of rubble because there was no vegetation holding it back because the fires had hit it the summer before. So uh, floods, uh, fires, and then drought uh, would be the other one. We've been in a statewide drought uh, most of the last two years, really affecting our ag communities, our farmers, our ranchers. That's a big economic driver of Colorado. We've been really focused on how we can help our, our ranchers and farmers prosper and succeed and transfer to a new generation. But it's really challenging in the face of a changing climate. A Pew Research poll from 2020 found that Americans believe that the federal government has not done enough to address climate change. What actions can the states take independent of the federal government to help address climate change? First of all, I agree with that. I really hope we get help from the federal government. But in the meantime, it's really up to states and local governments, cities, counties, states. Um, as an example, in our state, we are uh, locked in by rule and law. We'll be at over 80 percent renewable energy in just seven and a half more years by 2030. So very rapidly building this out. Our goal is 100 percent renewable energy statewide by 2040. There's already uh, a couple uh, towns that are already there. Actually, Aspen, Colorado was the first in the country to achieve 100 percent renewable energy for its municipal utility. And there's many cities and counties in our state, including major jurisdictions, that will be at 100% by 2030. So uh, it really takes everybody working together to get there. We'd love to see a, a national policy and support for helping our country lead the way. Are there any obligations states are required to meet as a result of federal policy or commitment like the Paris Climate Agreement? There's, um, you know, there's some, they're, they're not really, uh, they're not always on point. Uh, you know, there's a Clean Air Act that dates from the Nixon administration. We have obligations under that. The, uh, the, the, the Paris Climate Accords uh, as are not binding in state law for states to meet. So you can have states that choose to do nothing and states that choose to do a lot. Um, there are at least some uh, sort of floors that states, you know, can't get away with any pollution because of the inner jurisdictional nature of pollution, right? Like you admit something here and wind can take it to Nebraska, it can take it to Texas, vice versa. It really makes sense for the federal government to play a role in keeping our air clean and doing our part on climate.
federal government has passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act back in November, and it allows states to receive between two and forty-five billion for infrastructure projects, including funding for climate change and climate policies like zero emissions public transportation and school buses and the electric grid updates and many other things as well. Kind of along the lines of what you you said earlier, you have many states that are already at eighty percent. You look to get to one hundred percent renewable energy. So how how are Colorado and other states? Using that money specifically as it relates to projects that will reduce the environmental footprint, and is that enough to get the jobs done? And and I just even add on to that, I'm, it's it's new to me that you guys are at eighty percent of renewable uh, energy in in certain states. What are you doing, and what are you going to continue to do with that money that other states may not be doing? So it's a good start, is the short answer, Mark.、Uh, it's going to help us build out electrical vehicle charging infrastructure, and we've added to that on the state side. Thirteen percent of vehicles sold in Colorado were electric last month. This is big. This is happening now. When I talk to folks, I say, "Raise your hand if you drive an electric vehicle." Some do, and I say, "You know what? For those who haven't, there's a good chance your next、uh, car will be,、uh, because you know what? They're less expensive to operate, especially with gas where it's at. It just makes sense for people." But、uh, it's already, you know, and we gotta have the fast charging infrastructure. Another key piece is there's some funding for electric school buses, replacing、uh, those diesel school buses that kids have been taking to school for decades. Not only does that help our climate, but it helps kids' health, especially with asthma, especially bus drivers who are around them every day, kids. So、um, it's a start. We're going to try to match that with some state money as well that we're, we're putting towards that.、Uh, so there's several pots of money in there, but it, it's not enough for the entire clean energy transition. It's just sort of a start on the infrastructure side of it. Over the next couple of years, we're very grateful for it. And then, as you mentioned, our transit agencies also receive some money under that under that、uh, under that bipartisan bill. On a related note, gas prices have been steadily rising over the past year, hitting record numbers with a recent spike resulting from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In 2022, we see the biggest increase of new electric cars coming to the market, and EV sales have been doubling and even tripling year over year. Uh, is the nation's infrastructure ready to transition to electric vehicles, and what kind of investments are required to make that happen? So, if you'd asked me a year or two ago, I'd say you know infrastructure might hold it back, but I think we're in a very different place today because of the bipartisan infrastructure act. And as I mentioned, in Colorado, we have another infrastructure investment in EV. So, yes, we will be there with fast charging. The utilities are are at the table; they're in the game. We're actually I uh, just uh, unveiled at our. Uh, our state parks are all going to have、um, uh, fast charging infrastructure. It's a partnership with Rivian, which is,、uh, you know, kind of a, a great four by four that fits that outdoor lifestyle. There's also 40 Lightnings electric pickup trucks coming on the market soon. So they're really entering all classifications of vehicles.、Uh, it, it's, it, you know, when people see their high cost of gas, they're like, "Wow, I can zero that out." And by the way, electric vehicles also have much lower maintenance. So it's not only the gas you save. It's also、uh, much less wear and tear and maintenance, so they're just less expensive to operate. And with some of the rebates up front,、uh, it can actually cost you the same or less, and then cost you a lot less for operating. So it's happening. And yes,、um, I, at least in Colorado, and I believe nationally because of the infrastructure act, the infrastructure will be there and is there today, and increasingly so going forward. One of the primary concerns when it comes to electric vehicles is how that electricity is produced. So, what are states doing to ensure that we have enough electricity from renewable energy to power these? Technologies of tomorrow, or I guess even of right now. So first of all, you know, EVs reduce emission even when you have states that might have a lot of coal or natural gas at their grid, because there's really nothing that's less efficient than that really small internal combustion engine. That is a very inefficient way, from a climate perspective, of converting fossil fuel into energy. So even the larger scale plants. Have several times more efficiency. Now that being said, we're going to be at 80% renewable in Colorado in just seven and a half years. Other states aren't fully there. Some will probably be 20, 30, 40, 50%. But the key thing is, is that as any state looks at adding new capacity, solar and wind are simply far less expensive than new coal plants. I mean, they're 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 you know one third, one quarter the price for production,、uh, and so you see a lot of the new、uh, capacity going in. On both solar and wind, in areas that maybe have it hydro, and over time that'll lead to the retirement of coal. So I think it's really、uh, baked in.、Uh, it's happening a little faster in Colorado, but it's it's going to happen everywhere. That's great. Last question, Governor. What's the most important step forward needed for climate policy in the U.S.? We would love to see a national approach. So I mean, you know, there's this vague term, kind of build back better, but it was like this package of all these things that nobody understood. But one thing that I hope Congress does is make an sizable investment. 
in, in clean energy infrastructure. What does that mean? It means supporting EV infrastructure, reducing the cost of EVs, uh, souping up the technology on storage. Uh, it would, really, the federal government is well positioned to do that. That's probably the most important thing they could do for climate, as well as work with states like ours that actually want to lead the way to help us do that even more. Um, in the meantime, continue at the local level. I mean, activism starts at home. Uh, recycle and compost in your home. We do that. Uh, another little tip, make sure if you drive a diesel car, especially or, or a gas car, especially that your tires are fully inflated, you actually get much worse mileage per gallon if your tires aren't fully inflated. So uh, check them regularly. It'll also save you some money because gas is so expensive. So just, you know, the things that individuals can do. And of course, continuing to call your elected officials, local, state, federal. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, Republican, Democrat, don't have a party, but just say, look, um, I live here. Uh, you know, I want to, my family and, and friends to be able to live here for generations, do something on climate, take action on climate. And the more people hear that, uh, the faster our state and nation will be able to go. I, I was just going to say you're one of my favorite speakers. Thanks for doing this on a Sunday, but it really is yeah. great to hear you. Just very concise and to the point. And I'm, I'm glad you. Yeah, I want to give people some like tangible things they can do in their home and like yeah. call politicians because sometimes calling politicians just doesn't feel like you're accomplishing anything. So in the meantime, compost, <laughs> complete your tires, right? The most important thing that we're trying to do is to make sure, like you said, people engage with their with their elected officials. It yeah. doesn't matter if they feel. Uh, a kinship with them by party or by no party sure. whatsoever. Just reach out and activate and, and, and hopefully it's nice to hear that folks like you care what people think regardless of whether they voted for you. Thank you so much. Take care, Governor. Yeah.